Matthew 10 and verse number 24. And if you find that passage of Scripture, if you'll stand and we'll honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Matthew 10 and verse number 24. Jesus is continuing to give some direction, some instruction to these disciples. And so he says in verse 24, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is, and here's a, a good word, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground, or fall on the ground, rather, without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we've prayed several times this morning. We don't want it to be just something that we do or become a routine. We're sincerely asking for your help because we are people that stand in need. We need what you can help us with. We need help in understanding. We need help in, in being clear uh, as the message is preached and, Lord, as we understand it and receive it. And then we also need help with the response. Help us, please, to respond. Not just to say, well, this is God's Word or, or uh, we're just here in church. Help us to ask you and be open that when you speak to our heart about some issue or something that uh, you know is within us, then, Lord, would you do as you said in the passage. You make it clear, reveal it to us, so that we might again confess and forsake. We'll be very grateful. Would you please teach us, even this morning, what it means to be a disciple? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, Jesus has given some instruction. He started that in the first part of Matthew chapter number 10. Some instructions about the mission they were supposed to be on, the the. the Emphasis of the mission is found in verse number 7, and we've made reference to that as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's given some instruction, certainly. He's given some warnings. We talked about that the last couple of weeks, about the opposition that they were going to face. If you're going to stand for Christ, there's going to be some that will oppose you and stand against the message, certainly. But now Jesus does what He oftentimes does. He gives some encouragement to these disciples. There, there's some... Uh, kind of a shot in the arm or just some, some reinforcement of some things that they should already know or should already understand. But he's just reminding them once again to, to encourage them, to help them, to strengthen them on this journey that they will be on. And we, we can certainly read in other portions of the Gospels, whether it's other portions of Matthew or Mark or Luke or in John, that as Jesus reveals more about the life of what it means to be a true disciple... As more of the truth comes out of, of what, it, what it really means, what is it going to require of me if I really want to be a disciple, what it might look like uh, when other people treat me in, in different ways. As Jesus reveals more and more of this life of a disciple, well, guess what happens to the number of disciples? It goes down and down and down and down. Oh, you mean it's not uh, all sunshine and roses and, and uh, we don't make lots of money and we don't get big you know, recognition or our name and likes, that, that's not what it means? No. No, sometimes you might be persecuted for what you believe. Uh, oftentimes, in fact, Jesus would say in this passage of Scripture, if they called me the devil, then guess what they're going to call you? Uh, the devil. Well, anybody in here just love being called the devil? I, I know I don't. You know, you just, I can't wait to be persecuted today. Boy, that's what I rise and shine for. No, no one really in their right mind thinks that way. But those who decided that, that living their life for Christ was too great a burden, kind of understanding what Jesus was saying, and really when people began to understand what it meant to really follow Christ, they begin to fall off the scene. I mean, they, they had the best preacher, the best leader, the best teacher, and yet what it 
kind of boiled down to was 12 men who decided, yeah, this is something worth giving my life to. And even as we read, one of them was not even really a true follower. And I can't help but think that, that Jesus, although he's speaking to these 12 disciples at this time, and really through the gospel message, he's speaking to you and to me here this morning. I can't help but think that Jesus, as he's speaking these words, even has a heart. His mind is, is drawn toward that one, Judas Iscariot, who he knew was not, had not given his heart to Christ. He had not truly believed on Christ. He was just simply following to see what he could get out of this relationship. I can't help but think as he's, he's saying these words here in Matthew 10, he's speaking, he's thinking toward Judas. Judas, you, you need to understand what it means. And I know the decision that you, you, you will make at some point. I know what you will do, but I, I want to tell you, Judas, that... You can still come to me. You can still trust. You can still turn your life over to me. And we know that Judas was, was not a true disciple of the Lord. He had not given his heart to Christ, but at this point he was still a follower. And so Jesus is addressing both him and this group of 12 and us this morning as well. And so as we read the passage, I think uh, the question that we really need to ask ourselves is this. Do you really want to be like Christ? Do you really want to? And, and most of us who are here this morning would probably say, yes, that's really what I want. But understand what Jesus is doing is he's, he's telling us, if you really want to be like me, if you really want to follow me, then it's going to cost you something. That there's going to be some, some requirement put on your life. There's, there's a standard that needs to be met. And by the way, if you want to rise in any, in any job, if you want to rise in any level of education or, or, or in any, any where that you, you serve or, or you gain some kind of notoriety, you understand there is a standard that, that's in those places. Right? You have to adhere to a standard. You have to really exceed or even excel above that standard. And so don't let us think that, well, I can just be saved and, and I'll be a disciple just by being saved. No, no, being a disciple is different than just being saved. Right? Those, those are two different things. I can be saved without being a disciple, but I cannot be a disciple without being saved. Do I really want to be like Christ? Because if I really do want to be like him, if that is really my heart's desire, then you need to understand this, then, then your life cannot and will not stay the same as it is right now. It, it cannot and it will not stay the same if I really, if, if in my heart truly, I want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the kingdom of God is, is entered into and the kingdom of God is served on God's terms, not on your terms and not on my terms. I don't enter into the kingdom of God. I don't enter into being a child of God on my terms. I enter in on God's terms. It's His kingdom. That, that just makes sense. I don't get to say, well, here's what I think about that. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God says. Nor do I get to serve in God's kingdom and serve Almighty God on my terms. I serve on God's terms. So if you want to avoid being betrayed, if you want to avoid being hated, if you want to avoid being persecuted, then let's just say it. Then don't become like Christ. Don't do it. The, the more Christ is evident in your life, the more Christ is evident in the life of your family and in the way that you raise your family, I'm going to tell you, the harder it is going to become for you in this world in which we live, it's going to be harder to stand for Christ. It's going to be harder for your children to, to make decisions for Christ because they're, they're faced with all kinds of things. By the way, it's going to be harder for you and I to, to stand for Christ in our workplace, maybe with family members or other friends. But understand that as you become more like Christ, what Jesus is saying in the passage here in Matthew chapter number 10 is the greater you also realize the love, the care, and the concern that Christ has for you. You draw closer to Him. You realize how much He does love you. And I'm telling you, there is no better person that you could pick to have care for you, to have love you, than the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I love my wife, but I can't love her like Jesus does. I love this church. But I can't serve and love this church like Jesus does. 
See, I, I might love a Sunday school class, or I might love the teachers or those people who serve alongside us, but I can't, I can't take care of you. I can't love you like Jesus does. And so that's why we would have lessons like we are in Sunday school about contentment. You, you and I need to be content with what Jesus Christ gives to us. By the way, it's much more than you ever deserve. He, he is showing and showering his love upon you. And I'm telling you, the very base, the very lowest level that he does that is with material things. <laughs> the spiritual things are much greater in value. So what Jesus says here, I think, is you and I, if we love Christ, if we want to follow him, if we want to be like him, then we need to bear the marks of true discipleship. What does it mean to be a true disciple? Well, let's look at the passage here. Number one, I want you to understand this. Jesus says, be reliant. Be reliant because fear is going to tempt you. <laughs> fear can be a real part. It is a temptation to, to come away from the things of the Lord, to not stand for Christ as we should. And I, I would hope that no one here today thinks of themselves in the way that Jesus maybe mentions it in verse number 24. The disciple is not, and the word that he uses is above. I would hope none of us think that we are above the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do, you're mistaken. You're not above him. So verse 24, verse 25, if Jesus was persecuted, if he was treated wrongly, if he was slandered, and if he's our teacher and our master then we can expect that we are going to endure what he endured. Again, verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Now there's some relationships that we see in verses 24 and 25. There's a, there's a disciple and a master. Does everybody see that, verse 24? That's a, a choice that I make. All right? I choose to be a disciple of someone or something. All right? Does everybody understand that? Regardless of, of if you follow Christ or not, you're a disciple of something, of some way of living your life. Okay, And so there's a, there's a choice that's made in verse number 24. It's that relationship of a disciple and a master. I'm the disciple. I'm choosing who my master is. And as I choose who my master is, I'm saying, I want to be like that person or like what they, they are doing or what this, this mission is a part of. And so I'm trying to conform myself to be like that person, like that image, like that, 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 that company or that, that slogan or whatever it is I'm, I'm choosing as my, my master. But notice the second relationship is that of servant and Lord. And that's not something I necessarily select. It is something I can subject myself to. And I would say that if we're honest, every one of us has a Lord in some, some aspect. Right? We have someone who is an authority over us and... and we, we can't get out from underneath that. We, we like to be uh, independent. We like to be on our own. We like to call our own shots or we like to think that we do. But understand, you, you're, not, you're not in control of your life. Verse 25 then, the relationship is Lord, a servant rather, and Lord. There's disciple and master. But notice... In verse number 25, there's a third relationship that comes in here. How much more shall they call them of his what? His household. There's a family relationship that goes on here. Right? And that's also part of it, being a disciple is it's not just I'm submitting myself to a master. It's not just that I am I'm a slave to, to whatever my master wants me to do. It's not just that I'm, I'm learning and becoming more like that, that master. But I also get to enjoy the relationship of family as a part of that. I have now a heavenly father who is not just there telling me and bossing me around, telling me what to do or trying to control my life in, in some certain way so that he, he gets just, uh, uh, just enjoyment out of making me do whatever. No, no, he gets pleasure when I become a servant and I enjoy becoming a servant because I get to understand the benefits of who my heavenly father is. Amen. And so there's, there's interesting relationships here. And if you proclaim the name of Christ... If you submit yourself under God's leadership in your life, you understand you will probably endure a measure in some measure of what he had to endure. If you proclaim the name of Christ, just mark it down. You will be betrayed by someone who you love. 
The world will hate you or hate what you stand for. And you will be persecuted in some way. And I'm telling you, what Jesus is saying is, it's not because they hate you, it is because they hate the Christ who you love, who you've submitted yourself to. People called Jesus Satan in verse number 25. It was what he said. By the way, we read that already in Matthew chapter number 9. We read it here in Matthew chapter number 10. We're going to read it again in Matthew chapter number 12 where the works of Christ are ascribed to or, or, or said that they are, they are given to him by Satan himself. So if your life is identified with Christ, what Jesus says is they will call you the same. They will call you to be Satan or, or working for the devil. And you know, as I sit here and, and think through just modern day Christianity that, that we live in and, and amongst, I think we're, we're prone to sit back we're prone to kind of rest on our laurels, so to speak. We're prone to settle for religious routine and comfortable Christianity. Why? Because comfortable Christianity is safe. If I, if I think that, well, I'm standing for Christ because I'm coming to church. And by the way, you coming to church is a testimony in your neighborhood. But if it just stops with you saying, well, I got in my car and everybody sees me leave. Well, they get in your car and see you leave for work, too. They, get in, they see you get in your car and, you know, go see a movie or go to a play or a show or whatever it is that you choose to entertain yourself with. They see you do that too. And they don't really bother too much if you're going to a ball game, going to take your kids to the park. No one's concerned about that. But the moment you begin to stand for Christ in a strong manner, that is, you're, you're not doing it to be mad or angry or to, to draw persecution, but you're doing it because Jesus wants you to, and you're trying to be a witness and testimony. Understand this, there's going to come some opposition. It seems like in the world in which we live, we can do anything and everything but witness for Christ. If we name the name of some other God or we, we want to lift up some other, other person or some other program, then, then we're free to do any of those kind of things. But the moment we name the name of Christ, we, we automatically have a problem. And I'm telling you, safe Christianity is where the world wants us to be. That's where the unsaved, the lost person wants you and I to stay. Is just you keep that to yourself. As long as we keep to ourselves and we live like everyone else, we face little risk in this world. But the problem is, on, on the other side of that, if that's where we, we are contented to be, then you're going to know so little of the Christ who loves you and gave his life for you. You're going to know so little of the fellowship and what that means. Sunday nights were in 1 John, and, and I've enjoyed the study. Let me remind you of 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 6. Listen to what John said. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So as Jesus walked, as Jesus stood for truth, as Jesus uh, uh, would, would even give rebuke when it was necessary, then God says that's how we are supposed to walk. And that's the message really of verse number 25 in our passage here this morning. It is enough. It is sufficient, it is satisfactory that you become like Christ. This is discipleship. Discipleship is not a 100-page a, a book or 13 lessons. That's not necessarily discipleship. All of those things are tools to, to, to get you on the road to being a disciple. But being a disciple is being like the Lord Jesus Christ. Living your life as He desires you to live. Standing against things He wants you to stand against. And then accepting or welcoming things that, that are welcoming to Him or, or He wants you to welcome in your life. Matthew 28, verse number 20. Remember that great commission? Here's what Jesus said. Teaching them to observe what? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. That is making disciples. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what God has said. By the way, it doesn't just begin in Matthew and it doesn't end with, with John. It begins in Genesis and it ends with Revelation. All of these things, here's what God has said. This is how He wants you to act, how He wants you to behave, how He wants you to think. Here's the motivations He wants you to have. That's discipleship. That's teaching them to observe the things whatsoever God has commanded us to do. The, the, the true disciple of Christ does not demand to be accepted. 
He does not demand to be loved by the world when his Lord was rejected by the world. His Lord was crucified by the world. He doesn't expect commitment to the Lord to cause him to become famous or to become respected when his Lord was considered infamous and despised. Hold your place in Matthew. I want you to see some verses in John. Look at John 16. Hold your place in Matthew 10. Look back at John 16, just the first three verses of John 16. The moment I expect I deserve something because I'm a Christian or because I'm a pastor <laughs> is the moment I stop being like Christ. Got a little quiet on that one. Maybe we should revisit that at some point. John 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be, what? Offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you, will, no, now notice this, whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. You can expect there's going to be some trouble. But what Jesus is getting to is don't, don't worry about those things. Don't be concerned with those things. We need to remember that what Jesus has just said regarding the reason the world would mistreat us is found back in Matthew 10 and verse number 22. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. So this is why I consider the words beginning in verse number 24 of Jesus. I consider these to be an encouragement. Verse 26 what are the first three words? Verse 26, Matthew 10. And everybody lost their place, evidently. Fear them not. Right? Fear them not. Look at verse number 28. Beginning in word number 2. Fear not them. Oh, we switched it up a little bit. Same message. Look at verse number 31. Fear ye not therefore. Three times in six verses, Jesus says, we are to fear not. If you've had the opportunity to share the gospel, I can guarantee you, you've also had the opportunity to be fearful about doing that. I mean, that's just how it goes. There's some nervousness, some trepidation there. And oftentimes what people say is, well, I don't know if I can ever do that because I don't know if I get the words right. I don't know if I do it as well as I would want to do it. And so we get fearful, either one, of what somebody's going to think of us, or two, of messing up the message. There's fear that can be involved there. And God is not naive or God is not unknowing that He knows our frame. He knows that we will be fearful of those things. And so what He says here in those three instances is, don't fear that stuff. Don't be afraid to make a stand for Me. I will help you in those matters. Fear can be a real temptation to, to stop you from doing some things. There, there, are, there are people who can walk a city block, a city street in a neighborhood, and who can take a door hanger and put it on a door, but you have not yet been a part of that because you're fearful to do it. Here's what God says. Don't, don't fear that. Don't, don't worry about that. I will watch over you. I will take care of you. Don't let that fear, don't let that whatever you think of embarrassment or anything, don't let that tempt you to not serve, to not be like the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, fear is one of the largest obstacles for people to serve the Lord in the day and time in which we live. By the way, it's not just in our day and time. It's in Matthew chapter number 10. Because Jesus tells these 12 who have chosen to drop everything else and follow Christ, I know what's in your heart. Don't fear. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. He instructs us to live with a changed mindset. So here he says, number one, if I'm going to be reliant because fear can tempt me, then I, then I need to see things, God says here, from an eternal perspective. That'll help me not to fear. See things from an eternal perspective. Look at verse number 26. One day... The sin and the evil of the world, world are going to be exposed. Fear them not, therefore. Why? For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. 
So the sin in the world, the evil of the world, the, the, the wickedness that mankind does, he might do it right now cloaked or, or covered up or try to hide it as best he can. But understand, none of those things are hid from God. And he says at the very right time, when it's God's perfect timing, not your timing, not my timing, but on God's timing, he's going to make all that stuff exposed. All of that will be known. Don't worry about that. Don't get all twisted up inside. I can't believe this is going on. God, how long are you going to let this happen? By the way, I think I read that somewhere else. Oh yeah, the book of Revelation. When, when the saints look down at all the things that are going on and all the wickedness that is happening, and they turn to the Lord and say, how long are you going to let this happen? And what does he say? When it's my time. When it's my time. The Old Testament people, the nation of Israel, kept looking at the nations around them and, and, and suffering from, from, from trusting in God and, and, and trying to, to do what's right. And in some certain instances, they look around and say, look at all these nations. Look at how much they prosper. How long are you going to let them do that when they, they, they serve wicked idols? And what does he say? The cup of, cup of iniquity is not yet full. He's giving them opportunity and opportunity and opportunity and opportunity to come to trust in Him. Amen. Because he's gracious and merciful. By the way, he's much more gracious and merciful than you could ever be. See things from an eternal perspective. God's justice will prevail. You don't have to vindicate yourself. You don't have to fight for yourself. You let God do that. He's much better at it than you are. The enemies of the gospel, again, may, may currently do their deeds in darkness, but God sees every one. Our responsibility is to be bold in speaking out against those things. Fear of what people may say. Fear of what people may think about you. Fear of what people may do to you has hindered many testimonies and opportunities to serve in Jesus' name. Again, you don't have to raise your hand. I think I pretty well know the answer. But it, none of us want to be mistreated. None of us gets up and says, man, I can't wait to be mistreated today. I can't wait to or somebody to slander me or stab me in the back. I just, I live for that. No, no, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to die. But Jesus is telling his disciples, fear not about those things. Those same people who you currently are fearful of, they're going to be exposed. You are going to be vindicated. Justice will be served. God settles every one of his accounts. He might not settle them in August but he does settle his accounts. Verse 26, the word therefore. It refers back to the words in verse number 25. Fear them not, therefore. So the words in verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If that is sufficient, if that is, is what can, can, can make you to be contented, then understand, you don't need to fear if they come after you. It is enough. If you give your life as Christ did for you, it is enough for you. Was it enough for Jim Elliott? Took a Central American Indian spear, took his life. Young man wanted to serve God. Taken. Guess what happened as a result? His wife stays faithful, goes back into that same village, wins the chief to Christ, and the whole village trusts Christ as a result of how they reacted to persecution in their life. You, you think with an eternal perspective. The word therefore again, verse 26, refers back to those words. The word for then in verse number 26, if you'll see it there uh, in, the, in the verse, fear them not therefore, for, that word is looking forward then to the promise that God will make everything right in the end. We can rest assured that no amount of, of deception of the world, no amount of trickery in, that the world tries to play is confounding God. It's not deceiving Him. We should not be concerned, God says, with what the world says right now. Rather, we should be concerned with what God will say at the judgment day. That's when you and I need to be concerned. And if you have chosen not to become a Christian because you're afraid of what someone might say, what Jesus says directly to you in Matthew 10 is this, don't fear now. You fear what might happen later if you never make that choice. Because judgment will come. And it will be like nothing you can ever imagine. And we don't say that to scare you or make you mad. We say that because we love you enough to tell you the truth. Verse 28. 
the faithful disciple, values his soul much more than he values his own body. Look at what he says in verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, the the true disciple is willing to be discomforted in his body, this body, for the sake of that which is spiritual and incorruptible. And when you breathe your last breath on this earth, you understand that you spend the next moment of eternity in heaven, forever with Christ, and you take on a body that is incorruptible. No one can harm you any longer. So don't fear what they can do to your body here. You fear what might happen if you never trust Christ, if you never choose to follow Christ. And it seems to be a strange way to give encouragement. Well, you know, they may take your life. Well, I don't want that to happen. And if we're honest, the only way that these words in verse 26 and verse 28, the only way those things are an encouragement is if we live in reality of verses like Colossians 3 and verse number 3. What does that say? For ye are dead. Ye are dead. Ye are dead. Well, uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm living. Yeah, you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know what Paul said? For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. So what is Jesus saying in Matthew 10? Don't fear if they can take your body. All that they do is you now graduate to heaven. You, you, you get persecuted, you get slandered, you get stabbed in the back. I know it hurts. By the way, if anybody knows it hurts, it's Christ. But understand this, He does see, He does know. He's where you can get encouragement from. He will take care of you. So I should see with eternal perspective. If, if I'm not going to let fear be the temptation or to draw me away. I have to think with an eternal perspective. And then secondly, he says in verse number 27, then speak with boldness. Look at what he says, verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. It's an interesting custom that used to go on when men were training to be rabbis in the, the, the Jewish faith. They would have the, the seasoned rabbi would stand as he stood in the synagogue and he was undoing the scrolls and he would begin to read and sing through some of those, those scrolls. A rabbi would be right in his ear and he would be giving him words to say, words of encouragement or words of emphasis that might happen right there, that, that maybe portion of Scripture, something that might point to a coming Messiah. And so he would whisper it into the, the training rabbi's ear, and then that training rabbi would listen, and as he was being whispered to, he would give it, kind of like a modern-day uh, earpiece, you know, in the ear, Cyrano de Bergerac. Does anybody read any other books beside the Bible, Cyrano? All right, evidently not. Um, That's what Jesus is referencing here. What I'm telling you, what I'm whispering to in the ear, that's what you're going to pass along to other people as well. Speak with boldness. So in light of what we know is coming, it is faithless on our part. It is short-sighted on our part to hide the light now. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? You don't light a candle and put a bushel basket over it. That that doesn't make any sense. You light a candle so that it spreads its light everywhere it goes. Right? He's saying the same thing here. What I'm telling you in darkness, what, what, what other people might not be able to hear, that's what I want you to proclaim on the housetops. I want you to, to shout the message, message loud and, and everywhere that you go. I don't hide the light to avoid persecution. I don't hide the light to avoid criticism. Disciples get their message from the Lord, not themselves. That's, again, part of the message in verse number 27. I don't come up with the message on my own. Right? I study God's Word. I try to find out what is God saying and then pass that message along. That's what Jesus is trying to get His disciples to understand here in verse number 27. The message then should be boldly declared. Our Lord knows there are things that are going to cause you and cause me to have fearfulness, to, to have those fears or allow those fears to rise up in our life. But He also says, don't fear. Fear not. Okay, so first, be reliant on Christ. Be reliant because fear will tempt you. Here's the second thought. Be strengthened because our Father will take care of us. Be strengthened because our Father will take care of us. Verses 29 through 31 are a tremendous picture 
of the care that God has for you and for me who are His children. One of the reasons why we, why we put such an emphasis on Bible doctrine in our church, and, and churches just like ours across the nation and really around the world, one of the reasons why we, we emphasize Bible doctrine is, number one, it gives us a good foundation, yes. But also, when we understand what the Bible says and we understand what God teaches us, it ought to bring us comfort in things like this. It ought to help us to, to understand who God is and, and the way that He thinks about us. For example, look at verse number 29 of Matthew chapter number 10. Jesus offers reassurance through the omnipresence of God. What's omnipresence? That's a big word that means God's everywhere at all times. So, verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And how many of them? One. One of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. I love what the words of what one uh, commentator said about that verse. God attends the funeral of every sparrow. He, he attends the funeral. He is present when even one of them falls to the ground. Sparrows are just such, such cheap and common birds. The Bible says here, Jesus says that when I paid the smallest amount of coin I could find, it's, a, it's equivalent to our penny, if you will. I, I paid a penny for one bird. They were so cheap and so common that the guy who sold them threw in another bird just for free. I, I read Luke chapter 12, and if I bought two birds, then he, he threw in... Five to get all together. So I, I had a total of five. I, I bought one. He gave me one free. I, I paid for two. He gave me another one free. And then he threw another one on top of that. It's like a baker's dozen, right? So they're, they're so common. They're so, so really worthless. They were served as, um, I'm not trying to gross you out, but they were served as hors d'oeuvres in the common household. It just, you know, it's, well, it's just a sparrow. I mean, what, what's the big deal? It's, it doesn't really cost anything. Okay, so understand what Jesus is saying. If they're just worthless birds to everyone else, but yet I attend the funeral of everyone, I, I know when one falls from the sky, don't you think I'll care about you? Amen. Don't you think I, I'm, I'm powerful enough to, to watch over you? God's omnipresence ought to be a comforting thing. God Himself says, verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore, why? Ye are of more value than many sparrows. He loves one. He attends one. We're more valuable than many of those things. Jesus uses the truth in verse number 30. Okay, so we saw God's omnipresence. How about the truth of God's omniscience in verse number 30? He uses that to encourage us. This hits home for me. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God doesn't just know the total of hairs on a head like Brother Tim's that's just full of hair. <laughs> he doesn't just know the total number. He knows every individual one. Amen. That's what he said. Yeah. What's hair? I mean, really, what's hair? <laughs> what's he saying? If he knows even the very number of every individual one of something that is worth nothing... How much more does he care about you? How much more will he take care of you? How much more does he see? When you stand for him and you suffer persecution, you have a family member stab you in the back. You have someone talk bad about you behind your, behind your back. Just because you, you wanted to, to, to take a stand for Christ, God sees, God knows. He wants to encourage you. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. Why? Look at what he says, verses 32 and 33. Even God's omnipotence can be relied upon as true believers boldly pro proclaim Christ in the world in which we live. The word in verse number 32, confess, is, it's a tremendous word. It literally means, and we've talked about this before, but it means to affirm or to agree with. So when I confess my sins, I'm agreeing with God about my sin. I've broken God's law. I confess those things to Him. He already knows that, but He needs to, me to acknowledge that. I need to understand, I have stood against God. I have broken God's law. And so when He says confess in verse number 32, it has the same connotation, but, but a little bit different application then in this verse. It is not simply verse 32. Notice what it says. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. It's not just recognize the truth of who Jesus is, but rather identifying with that truth. 
It is making that a part of my life. It is truly trusting in Christ, relying fully on Him. And, and the, the, the idea, the, the picture is putting all my weight on Christ. Not half, not, not three quarters. Well, I'm trusting in God three quarters, but then I need to do my part also. No, no, you need to rely fully on Christ for salvation. And there's salvation no other way. It is not just believing who Jesus is or believing that there was a man named Jesus. It is not even acknowledging that, yes, he was a good man or he was a good teacher. No, no. It is trusting in him for salvation. But verse 33, Whosoever shall deny me, those who refuse to agree with God and place their reliance upon God for forgiveness salvation they, they refuse to do that Jesus says that in the coming judgment there's no safety given no safety whosoever shall deny me before men him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven you know what he's not speaking about he's not speaking about the occasional failures that you and I often have you know how I know that because I read about a man named Peter in the Bible who said hours before, I will never, never deny you. You ever made one of those promises to God? God, if you'll do this, then I will fill in the blank. And what happened? Now you forgot about that and you still did it. You, you made a promise to God, I'm going to read my Bible more, and you lasted you know, a week, two weeks, a month. See, there are, there are occasional times when I've asked God to give me boldness to witness and I haven't done it when he put it on my heart to do it. He's not talking about those kind of occasional failures. Rather, he is stressing the importance of truly following God's plan for salvation rather than simply following without confession. And if you are God's child through salvation, then take heart. He never forgets or fails to care for his own. I've read a few different illustrations, and I'm telling you, there are so many examples in the lives of Christians down through the ages who have taken a stand for Christ in spite of those that might stand against them. There's one story, I don't believe it's, it's proper in its, its uh, uh, acknowledgement of who is involved in the story, but I, I believe the story itself uh, bears true because it, it, is, it was given as part of a memorial service for these, these soldiers but about the, the, the third century was when Constantine has seen that vision supposedly in the sky and he has made Christianity or some version of Christianity. I think it's a false version of Christianity, to be quite honest, as you study it out. But he's made Christianity to be the, the religion of the state. And he's, he's given freedom supposedly to, to those who would, who would worship Christ. Well, he was in league with another emperor, and that emperor decided that he was not going to honor that, that, uh, that treaty or that, that uh, cause that, that uh, um, Constantine had offered. And so he had some soldiers that he knew were some of the best soldiers in his, his, his army. They were specially trained. They were tremendous athletes, and they had been sent out on this secret mission or this, this kind of special mission from the emperor. During the mission, 40 of these men had been saved. They trusted in Christ for salvation. It was a tremendous, tremendous testimony. Word got back to the emperor who wasn't for Christianity. And he sent a message to his general, you tell those men that if they do not renounce Christ, if they do not pledge allegiance to me and to their country, they will be executed. Well, the time happened to be during the winter months. And they were encamped by this lake that had frozen over. The, the, the general got word and he called for everyone in the company to come forward. And he said, if you have named the name of Christ, if you become a Christian, I want you to step forward. Forty men stepped forward. He forced those men to take off of their armor, to lay their weapons down, to strip down to nothing and stand down on the cold lake all night. They built a fire on the lakeside and said, if you will renounce Christ, you can come and warm yourself by the fire. No questions asked. Forty men stepped out on that lake. They begin to sing a song, We the Wrestlers. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. The night went on, the singing grew fainter, and morning neared. At dawn, a lone man walked back and approached the fire. 
He confessed that his faith was not strong enough to face death. The guard that had been stationed at the outpost, when he saw this man, he heard the singers out on the, the, the frozen lake sing 39 wrestlers. Wrestling for thee, O Christ. He was so moved that he took off his armor, stripped down, and began to walk out onto the ice. And as he walked, he began singing. Forty wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. Do you really want to be like Christ? Young people, it's going to take sacrifice. You may stand when people tell you to sit. You may be quiet when other people tell you to not speak. I'm telling you, Christ sees and knows. He'll take care. Parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, single person, may cost you something to stand for Christ. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. Oh, it's worth it. Christ stood for me, took beating for me, took a crown of thorns for me, laid down his arms on a cross for me, and I'm going to be afraid of what somebody might think of me? No. No, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Am I perfect? No. But when I, I go against God, I understand him because I'm his child. He welcomes me back. Maybe you're here and you, you, you know in your heart you, you've done some things that you shouldn't have done. Can I help you? Let's confess it. Confess it. Ask the Lord for help. If you've never trusted in Christ, can I encourage you today? Make that decision today. It's the best decision you'll ever make. I don't guarantee it'll be easier. I don't guarantee your pockets will be lined with gold. I, I can't do that. By the way, I would say it's probably going to get harder. But just understand it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it.